All right. If you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians. If you are uh, happen to be a guest with us today, we are so glad you're here. So glad to see you. Um, but let me let me catch you up to what we've been doing. So we started about four ish weeks ago a series to the book of Philippians, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, and we called it Citizens because at the heartbeat of what Paul is trying to communicate here is that as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we are meant to to live and act and think as citizens of heaven not primarily as citizens of this world, living and breathing according to its values and its ways of living, but as citizens of heaven. That when people look at our lives and watch how we live, that they see a glimpse of heaven. That they see a glimpse of what it's like for God to be glorified in our lives. And last week, we kind of zeroed in on the thesis of Paul's letter. If you've ever written a paper for school, or if you're an English teacher, you know what a thesis is, right? It's the big, important sentence of that paper. It's, this is what I'm trying to tell you. And last week, we zeroed in on that thesis. And it was in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 27, he said, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. The way that you live should display the gospel. And that, that phrase, the way you live, the manner of life, means how you live as a citizen. The way you conduct yourself day in and day out. The way you conduct yourself at home when nobody sees. Because it's easy to conduct yourself publicly, right? I can, get, I can, I can keep my, myself together publicly for a little while, at least, right? Most of us have that much self-control. But to To be humble and to be loving and self-giving in private, that's another thing. So, whether in public or in private, we're to model the citizenship of those who belong to heaven. So, that's what Paul is trying to communicate here. And we now, today, we're moving into chapter 2, where we get into one of the most beautiful passages in Philippians which is often called the Christ hymn because many think it was an early song, an early description of what Christ did for you and I. So as we get into it, we've, already, we've also talked about how at Philippi they kind of had a problem with status and rank. They wanted, to be, they wanted to be the best. They wanted to be on top. Everybody was, was vying for power just like the Roman culture, right? They, they wanted to be number one. And let's be honest. It's good to be number one, right? It's good to be the best. Every time I get in my truck, I'm reminded by a little sticker that, or a little uh, card that sits just above my dash that I'm the number one dad. Did you know that? My oldest made that years ago in a church Sunday school class, and it sat on my dash, and every time I get in, it's just nice to know, well, at least somebody thinks I'm the best at something, right? It's good to be, to be number one. But it's what happens whenever that becomes actually real in our minds, whenever we begin to actually live like we think we're the best, and all of our life centers on us. Things begin to unravel. Things begin to go awry. Self-centeredness drives a wedge between all of our relationships. If all of us continue to live as if we are the center of the entire universe, our relationships are going to be difficult because we're going to be constantly at odds with one another. Think about a a life where that exists. Think about how your home might operate if everybody's like, no, somebody think about me. No, somebody think about me. No, somebody over here, I'm important. No, and we're all fighting for attention. Think about, that's how it goes sometimes, isn't it? But a house where that's the case is not a peaceful or unified house. It's a house where everyone's fighting to be on top. Everyone's fighting to be noticed. Everyone's fighting for attention to be on them, and no one is sacrificing to serve anyone else. So self-centeredness, just as it drives a wedge in the home, it'll drive a wedge in the church. It'll drive a wedge in the church. So what we're going to be looking at today in Philippians 2, 1 through 11, is this right here, this main idea. In order to maintain a Christ-honoring unity, we should model our attitude on the mind of Christ. We should model our attitude on the mind of Christ. And that word attitude is important. I'm sure many of us have heard that. Have you ever had to tell your kids, watch your attitude? Hey, watch that attitude. I don't like this. That's a bad attitude. I don't like that. 
right? Our attitude is the way that our, our, we shape our minds, the way that our mindset is functioning in a given day, right? Maybe you've said, oh, I, he just woke up on the wrong side of the bed. It means his, his, the way he's thinking isn't right. You're not thinking as a believer. You're not thinking and acting as, a, as one who belongs to Christ, as a citizen of heaven. So in order to maintain a Christ-honoring unity, we should model our attitude on the mind of Christ. Now remember, this is a Christ-honoring unity. What, did, what was Paul's main point a couple of weeks ago? That whether by life or by death, Christ would be honored in my body. That the way I live, I exist to honor Christ. Day in, day out, morning to evening, I'm here to bring honor to Christ. Not to bring honor to myself, not to draw attention to myself, but to draw attention to Christ. And if we're going to live with that type of life and those, types, those kinds of priorities, we have to model our mindset and our attitude after Christ. So let's look at chapter 2. We'll read chapter 2, 1 through 11, and then kind of walk through it. So verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the first thing I want us to see, if we're going to develop an attitude that honors Christ, but an attitude that mirrors the mindset of Christ, this is the first thing we must do. Number one, remember all we have in God. Remember all we have in God. Look back at verses one and two. He says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, or any participation in the Spirit, or any affection and sympathy, you might notice a little two-letter word in there. It says, if, if there is any, any of these things in God. That if is kind of a rhetorical if. It's, It's not a true if. It's more like it's an obvious thing that these things are in God. Maybe you have someone who's very sarcastic in your family and they just, their, their sense of humor is just like, you know, just super sarcastic, super dry. And they say something, you ask a question, they say, well, is the sky blue? Is the grass green? It's kind of like, of course it is. Paul, Paul's saying, of course there is encouragement in Christ. Don't you see that? So let's look through these different things and see what he says. He says, you have encouragement in Christ. When you look to Christ and his life, at how he lived, which he's going to unpack in a minute. Are you not encouraged that Christ would take the lower place of a, in human form, of a servant into death for you? Are you not encouraged that the Son of God would leave heaven and become one with human nature and experience the death that he experienced for you? Are you not encouraged by that? So is there encouragement in Christ? Absolutely. But then look at what he says next. Any comfort from love. Now, whose love is this? Is this Christ's love? I think it's a love that comes from the Father, because what you'll see next is that there is something that comes from the Spirit as well. So any, any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from the Father's love, or then any participation in the Spirit. I want you to think for a moment about the greatest blessing that it is to know Jesus and what it does for who you are and who you get to call yourself. Romans chapter 8 says that one of the greatest blessings of being a follower of Jesus is that you bear the name of a child of God, that God himself is your father. One theologian said that adoption, the idea that we have been adopted into the family of God, 
and we have God as our Father, and God is love toward his children, is the crown jewel of the Christian faith. Justification is wonderful. Sanctification is wonderful. But to know that I am known by God and loved by God with all of the messed up stuff that goes on in my heart and my mind, that is a comfort. That God loves me and he will not leave me no matter what. Are you comforted by that, Paul says? Are you encouraged by Christ? And then look at what he says. Any participation or fellowship, your translation may say, in the Spirit. When we've been brought into unit, union with Christ, that's, that's what salvation is, is that we have been united to Christ. It's not as if we, we get a little bit of salvation dust sprinkled on us and then the, and then the Father, the Son, and the Spirit kind of stay away. We are united to Christ so that Christ's end in, in eternity is ours. That we share. If you read the end of the the end of the book in Revelation, we are co heirs and co we reign with Christ in the end. Our fate is united to His, and that happens because of the Spirit. Because we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. If we have trusted in Christ, we belong to God, and that life that we enjoy in God, that secure life that has comfort from the Father's love. Sometimes that's hard to believe whenever life around you seems like it might be falling apart. Whenever you're walking through difficult circumstances to truly believe that the Father loves you, it's hard. But the Scriptures teach that. And in fact, it's in those low moments, Psalm 34, 18, that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And he saves the crushed in spirit. That's the Father. That's the Father for you. He is near to you. And all of this comes by this participation in the Spirit. But we don't have, it's not as if I am a solo uh, believer connected to the Spirit by myself alone. We are been, we've been given a family. We've been given a church. There are other children in this family, and we participate in this life together, in this life that is in God. So there is a Trinitarian life that we share. We have encouragement in Christ. We are loved by the Father, and we are gathered together and fellowship together in the Spirit. Paul says, if you have this, complete my joy by being of the same mind, by having the same love and in full accord and of one mind. Just as the Father is unified with the Son and the Spirit, the Trinity is unified together, we should model that in our relationships with one another. Just as we receive love and receive affection and receive sympathy from God, that's what we should be giving out in our relationships with one another. So any time in our relationships, particularly among believers, where we fail to express love, and maybe express anger or hatred or violence or anything like that, we are not living according to the way that God would have us live. In fact, we're demonstrating we don't believe the gospel. And that's basically what we waffle between. You remember the man in the gospels, he says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. We all are mixtures of that and struggle in unbelief at times. And when we struggle with unbelief, we begin to live as those who don't believe. We need to ask the Lord to help us to believe these things. Has the Lord really saved us in Christ? Do we have encouragement in Christ? Do we have comfort from his love? Yes, we do. But why do we forget these things? Why does he have to remind us? Three, three reasons. First, we're distracted by the world. We're distracted by the world. We live in a world that is so divided on everything. In fact, everybody's trying to find a little niche to become a, an influencer or a speaker about, and it's usually a point of contention. Because people have realized, hey, if I have a controversial opinion, people will pay attention to me. If I can, if I can create some division, people will begin to listen. And that's, that happens out there. That's what happens. Happens in the office. You have that one person that's the office gossip, and they just go around and they, oh, did you hear about this? But it also happens in the church. Oh, did you hear? 
we should pray for, mm -hmm, that's how it comes out sometimes. We should pray for so-and-so. We get distracted and our, we begin to assimilate according to the world's values, basically. We're distracted by the way the world operates, and that's how we live. So that's one way. We get discouraged by our circumstances. That's another. Sometimes our circumstances cause us to lower our gaze from God and to look and be fixated on our circumstances, and they turn us into a spiritual Eeyore. You remember Eeyore, don't you? From Winnie the Pooh? Oh, oh, woe is me, right? It happens to all of us. We've all been there. And to be honest with you, there are some times where it is warranted to feel grief and to feel concern and to feel sadness. Because there are things in this world that death, death is, is not the final answer for Christians, but we, and we grieve death, but Paul says what? We don't grieve as those who have no hope, but we do grieve, right? But there's a time in which we can get stuck in our circumstances. And we become so depressed and like Eeyore. But Paul says, that's not, how, that's not how I'm showing you how to live. Remember what happened in verse 12? We've mentioned this almost every week. He says, let me, let me tell you what has happened to me, right? I'm in prison. He could have easily said, oh, I'm in prison. I guess I'll just sit here and wait until something happens. But he's, no, he's sharing the gospel. He is continually preaching the gospel and leading others to Christ. So he's using this, what looks like a bad and discouraging circumstance for the advancement of the gospel. And that's how we should view ours. So when we're discouraged by our circumstances, think, how can this be a platform of the gospel? It's funny how God works and uses those things. Think about the life of Joseph, for example. You remember the Joseph story. But the third reason we, we forget is because, if we're just plain honest, we're distant from God. We're distant from God. And when you're distant and you, you leave home for a while, you forget how things operate. You forget the regular rhythms of life. Sometimes you're, you're removed from regular life. And then you're, you enter back into it. And you just forget, oh, this is what... This is who God is. This is what God is like. This is how he wants me to live. So rather than becoming distracted or discouraged or distant from God, we need to remember all that we have in God. Rehearse the gospel day in and day out. You're a child of God. God loves you. Christ is there with you through everything you walk through. And you've been bound together by other believers or by the Holy Spirit with other believers. Let that be an encouragement to you. So the first thing is remember all that you have in God. If we're going to live a Christ-honoring life of unity together and adopt the mindset of Christ, we have to remember all we have in God. The second thing we need to do is resist the pursuit of personal glory. Resist the pursuit of personal glory. Look with me in verse 3 of chapter 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. We've already mentioned how Philippi was a city that embodied Roman values. And it was, it's all about number one. It's all about me. What I can do to get to the top of the ladder. And I'll step on whoever I've got to step on to get there. What he says here, this word for empty glory or vain glory is kenodoxia. It means empty glory. There's nothing there. The glory that so many of us chase after and that the world chases after, this recognition from others, the awards and the accolades, it's empty glory. There's no real substance there. And Paul says, don't chase after that. Don't chase after that kind of glory. What is this empty glory? It's when we try to manufacture glory for ourselves and puff ourselves up with pride. Jonathan Edwards uh, was a pastor and theologian a long time ago, and this is what he said about pride. He said, pride is the worst viper in the heart. It is the first sin that ever entered into the universe. It lies lowest of all in the foundation of the whole building of sin and is the most secret, deceitful, and unsearchable in its ways of working. It is ready to mix with everything, and nothing is so hateful 
earthly God, contrary to the spirit of the gospel, or so of dangerous consequence. And there is no one sin that does so much let the devil into the hearts of the saints than pride. It's pretty bad, isn't it? He kind of lets us know pride is something that we should not mess with. Pride is something when it rears its head, we should be ready to kill it. John Owen was another, another uh, theologian and pastor, and he said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. And much like pride, if we're not daily dying to self, if we're not daily killing that viper of pride in our hearts, it will begin to eat us alive. Pride can manifest itself in a couple of ways. First, it's when we think too highly of ourselves apart from the grace and holiness of God. It's when we elevate ourselves above others. It's when we try to seek position or act like we are better than other people. That's one form of pride. But there's another kind of self-centeredness, another kind of pride, and it's not this outwardly boasting type. It's more internal, and it can masquerade as humility but it's, it's really not. It's the pride of self-pity. We want others to think well of us or to think about us so badly that we will constantly manufacture problems or situations that get us attention. If people understood what we meant, you know, if, if I'm going to upset someone, I, I don't want to do that, but we, we desire to be seen as glorious or worthy or valuable, so we will do something to gain attention on ourselves But in either case, we're self-centered. That's what lies at the heart of pride, is a self-centeredness. G.K. Chesterton said, How much larger your life would be if yourself could become smaller in it? How much larger your life would be if yourself could become smaller in in it? How much of life do we miss because we are focused on us? How much of our life do we miss? How many wonderful relationships do we miss because we're so concerned about getting ours? How many opportunities for sharing the gospel do we miss because we're, we're more concerned about how, what people think of us than we are their eternal destiny? Pride is dangerous for the church. You know, as we kind of get into this holiday season, we're moving through, we'll have Halloween, and then we'll have Thanksgiving, and then we have Christmas. There's a character that kind of embodies this type of life, and that's the Grinch. You remember the Grinch? Ah, what was wrong with the Grinch? Does anybody remember? His heart was two sizes too small. And if you've watched the cinematic version, you, you just see how grumpy this character is. And it does the backstory of, of how he came to be the Grinch, Right? How did he get to be the, because you don't become the Grinch overnight, right? It's something that works. It just, it kind of builds. And the Grinch was full of self-pity. Now, things happened to him as a a young Grinch, whatever you call him whenever he was little. As a young little Grinch, you know, he was bullied and things like that. But he allowed that to continue to stay in his heart, and it shrank his heart so that his disdain for others produced this movie. Now, of course, that's fictional, but a lot of us can identify with how that works in the heart. Pride will contract and contract, constrict your soul to the minuscule dimensions of selfishness where you cannot think about anything else but yourself. Pride will do that. You trust no one. You might as well do everything yourself. These are prideful thoughts of an egocentric and prideful mind. And Paul's trying to get us to understand that self-centeredness destroys relationships. It destroys fellowship and it destroys joy, but more than that, it destroys mission. Because that's what Paul's writing about, the advance of the gospel. We will not work together to advance the gospel if all of us are vying for the attention and the accolades and the spotlight. This is not unity for the sake of unity, so that we can be just another group of people that gather together during a certain amount of time, and we have a good time together, and then we go. This is unity for the sake of mission, unity for the sake of the gospel. So what do we do to fix the problem? If we want to resist the pursuit of personal glory, what do we do? Number three, 
reframe your thoughts around others. Reframe your thoughts around others. Look with me again at verses 3 and 4. Uh, in verse 4, he says, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Also to the interests of others. Everybody, every one of us has a phone. Maybe you have a smartphone. There's probably two cameras on it. The back-facing camera and then the front-facing camera. What happens with the front-facing camera? What do we do with that? Selfies. It frames us in the center. What Paul is saying is, Turn that camera around. Put others in the frame. Where you live your day. Think about whenever you're getting ready in the, mor- in the morning. Ladies, what's that little stand that you have with the mirror? What is that called? A vanity, right? Think about the, the what is that called? It's vanity, right? You To stare at yourself, right? Paul says that that's what we're doing when we live a selfish life, is we're putting ourselves front and center in that camera. We care nothing about the people out there. We are at the center of our universe. You know, even Loganville's slogan, you remember what, you know what it is? Guys, y'all live here. I don't live here yet. Come on. (laughs) Where people matter. It's on a sign just down the 81. (laughs) Where people matter is the slogan of Loganville. And it may be, it used to be something different. Where's Loganville, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but whenever you think about it, there's something deeply theological about people mattering. If the Bible is true, and it is, each one of us are created in the image of God with inherent worth and inherent value. And we do matter in the eyes of God. And people out there matter. People who are far from God matter. You matter. But the difference between the people who are far from God and you is that you are safe and secure and have the Father's love given to you. And they do not. And we exist to reach them with the gospel. That's why we're still here. Reframe your thoughts around others. Now, just as I say this, maybe in our minds, somebody in here is going to say, yeah, see, see, maybe you're, you're elbowing your partner or whatever you're saying, you're saying, yeah, you need to pay attention to my needs. Yeah, see, see, you need to pay attention to my needs. And just as you said that, you've lost the point. A humble person does not go around telling others to consider them. The question I'm, I'm asking here as we think about reframing our thoughts around others is not who are the humble people in the room. Who needs to be better at considering others? The question I'm asking is, are you humble? Do you consider the needs of others as more important than yours? And just to put it a little plainly, humility is like a greased pig. Just as soon as you think you've got it, it slips out from your grasp. Because humility, a truly humble person may not be aware of their own humility because they're so busy thinking about others. They're so busy dying to themselves and serving others that they don't think about whether or not they're being, being humble. So reframe your thoughts around others. And then lastly, and most importantly, reset your mind with the gospel of Jesus. Reset your mind with the gospel of Jesus. Verse 5 is kind of like the hinge of this text. You have what Paul said. He's trying to encourage them. Remember all you have in God. This is what you have. You're, you have comfort from the love of God, the love of the Father. You have encouragement in Christ the Son, and you have participation and fellowship with the Spirit of God that binds you together in unity. So look out for the interests of others. Don't just think about yourself. Think about others. And just in case you need a little bit more encouragement to do so, Paul says, Have the mind of Christ your Savior, because it's been given to you in Christ. Look at what he says in verse 5. He says, have this mind among yourselves, notice the plural, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're told to have this mind among us, which is given to us in Christ. As we mentioned, we are united to Christ in salvation and therefore given this mind to operate inside of. We are in Christ. Paul is basically pressing a reset button. If you grew up with the advent of video games, or if you ever played a Super Nintendo, or if you've ever played some of these video games, what always shows up on the video game console? There's a power button and there's a reset button. It's almost like they just anticipated there's going to be problems with this piece of technology, right? And when there are problems, you have this reset button. Now, not a lot of us use that reset button, especially if we had, you remember the cartridge systems like the Nintendo 64, the uh, Super Nintendo? What did you do with the game cartridge when it didn't work? You took it out, you blew in it, you banged it, you tried to knock it, and, you, and then, then you put it back in, and then it hopefully worked, right? But the reset button is there by design because technology, like you and I, is not infallible. We are going to make mistakes. We need our minds to be reset, the question is, when are you doing that? When are you, our, our, we live life at the speed of light. We're going, 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 going. Are you taking time to spend in the word, to reset your mind with the gospel? Are you carving out time to spend with God? To rehearse the gospel over and over. To remind yourself of your sin, to, but to remind yourself of the grace of God. One of the ways that we do that is through prayer and Bible study and personal devotion. It's one way we can re- we reset our mind. But the other is just by walking through this text and seeing what Christ did for you and me. He talks about the humility of the Son in verses 5 and 6. He says, He was in the form of God as the Son of God, and yet he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. The word for grasp means to snatch at to grasp. Hey, give me that. You ever watch kids play? Hey, give me that. That's mine. Hey, give me that. That's mine. A lot of us walk around in our relationships and that's what we do with attention and glory and honor. We say, hey, hey, pay attention to me. Have you ever been talking to somebody? And uh, this is what one comedian calls these people, me monsters. It's like every story kind of comes back to them. It's just like you're you're having a conversation and you want to, you want to get to know this person or you want to, you know, share something with them. But somehow, That conversation always makes that turn right back to them. That's kind of what Paul is saying here. That's what we do whenever we are, that's what what we're doing. We're grasping at attention, glory, and honor when we do that. But Paul, he says Jesus didn't do that. He didn't live life that way. He didn't live life, he set aside those things to take on human nature. Fully God, fully man. He was in the form of God and didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. The lowest place on the Roman totem pole. Remember what we said? What was the attitude in Rome? Let me climb that ladder. Let me get to the top. Jesus willingly took the low place. Willingly set aside honor. And that's what he calls us to do as well. Take the low place. Take the place of service. Remember the words of Jesus in the Gospels? The greatest must be the what? Servant of all. When we serve each other, when we take the low place, we're living like Christ. And sometimes it may feel as if we're losing something, but guess what? It's because we are. But we're losing something that doesn't matter. Earthly glory earthly attention, earthly approval. Because what did Paul say? He said it's empty glory. There's nothing of substance there. Don't worry about losing that. What we're after is eternal glory. What we are after is eternal glory in Christ Jesus. Look at what he says. Back down in verse, uh, in verse 7, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. We're going to celebrate this 
the incarnation here at, in, at, toward Christmas time. But he says, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Just really quickly, I want to say this was Spurgeon uh, who said this. Yes, he said, um, Charles Spurgeon, great English preacher, London, a long time ago, had a great beard. Um, he, uh, he said, obedience is the best humility. Obedience is the best humility. Why is that? Because it recognizes that there's a greater authority to whom I'm accountable. And it places me under his authority. It places myself low. Obedience is the best humility. But look at what happens through Christ's humility. Verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, Adam, in, back in Genesis, the first man, abused his authority, neglected his authority, and pridefully desired and grasped to be like God. But Christ shows us that to live as God requires is to relinquish our grasp on worldly greatness and glory and to embrace humility. And whenever we stop trying to grasp at earthly glory, you'll notice something. Your hands become free to serve others. Whenever you're not concerned about what you can gain, you're free to give. And through Jesus' humility, there was something bestowed on him. The name that is above every name. Eternal, heavenly glory from the Father. And in Christ, and in Christ, that same glory will be bestowed on you. As you are united to Christ, and you will share in that glory, provided you take the low place now. Don't chase after earthly glory. Don't chase after earthly accolades and attention now. It may come your way, but don't glory in it. Don't glory in the attention you get now. It may happen. But rejoice, not that the demons know your name, as Jesus said, but rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Rejoice that your Father knows you. In order to maintain a Christ-honoring unity, we have to model this mind of Christ. Remember what you have in God. Resist the pursuit of personal glory. Reframe your thoughts around others and reset your mind on the gospel of Christ. But in order to do this, you must know Jesus. You can't be like Christ until you know Christ. And that's the first step, is seeing what Christ has done for you. And if you're here today, and you've never truly understood what Christ Jesus did for you. You, we all begin this life living for ourselves. It's easy to see when you look at how kids live. Self-centered, prideful, life's about us. But as we grow, we begin to see how this sin manifests itself and demonstrates that we're far from God. Romans says that we are enemies of God, rebels against what God has intended for his creation. We want attention on us. We want to live how we want against God's order and against God's design in Christ. But in order to reconcile us to himself because of his great love, <clears throat> he sent Christ to die for his enemies. He sent Christ to die for you and me. While we weren't seeking God, God came seeking us. And he sent Christ to die in your place. And if you would trust in Jesus, if you would believe the gospel, that God wants to save you by his grace and not by your works, you will share in this glory in all of eternity. You will begin to know Christ. You will be brought into the family of God and know what it's like to have encouragement in Christ and know what it's like to have the Father's love and know what it's like to have fellowship in the Spirit. So if you've never trusted in Christ and you're tired of living 
a self-centered life. We have seen today that there is a much better way to live according to how God tells us to live. I would invite you today to put your trust in Christ. I would invite you to lay down your life and to pick up his, to trust in Jesus to save you. Now, if you're here today as a believer, and maybe you've been a believer for a while or a self-proclaimed believer, but if we're honest, the way you live and what you profess is not the same. You say you believe Jesus, you say you love Jesus, but there's no evidence of humility. There's no evidence of love. There's no evidence of grace in your life. I would encourage you to do some soul searching. I would encourage you to ask God to reveal where you went wrong. If you you just distanced yourself from God, have you become so discouraged in your circumstances? Or have you just decided you've got a better plan? And I would ask you today to repent of that and to come back to Christ and to trust him. As we pray, the band is going to come back up and play. And if you need to trust Christ, I'm going to be standing right here. You can come talk to me. We can pray together. But if you need to repent of the way you've been living, the altar's open for you to do that as well. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for how it challenges us. Lord, let us never be numb to the conviction of the Spirit. Because that conviction is more evidence that we belong to you. Lord, help us to listen well. Lord, we all struggle with humility. Because we all still have the old man that tries to rear his head. Pride still tries to take a hold in our life. Lord, help us to forsake that. Help us to die to ourselves daily so that we can live for you and serve others. Lord, I pray if there's anybody in here who does not, has not trusted Christ yet, Lord, that you would begin to work in their heart to trust him and begin to walk in the good life in Christ that you've intended for us. If there are those of us who need to repent of how we've lived, Maybe we've been living for ourselves and forgotten that our life is not for us. Our life is for Christ. Lord, convict our hearts and help us to change for the better by your Spirit's power. Because that's the only way that true, lasting change is going to happen is if you do it in us. But Lord, we also worship Christ today and magnify his name and thank you with great gratitude that he took the low place He set aside glory and honor to die in our place so that we could share in that glory and honor with him, so that we could know what it's like to be a part of the family of God. And we are so grateful for that. So Lord, as we sing, Lord, you move, and we will trust you with the results. In Christ's name, amen.